Hello. I've wanted to make this video for a long time now, and I'm really excited to finally share all of this with you. Last year I was promoted to the role of Senior Software Engineer, and I wanted to share with you the most important lessons that I've had to learn and follow to get there. In the organization I work at, promotions basically happen when you are already doing the job that you want to get. So it isn't a single step, it's more like a path, an ongoing process. A question is asked. Is this person a senior software engineer? And depending on the answer, you will either get the promotion or not. I don't really want to talk about the exact requirements that I had to pass, but more about things that aren't really in the job description. Some of these lessons I've learned even before joining this company, but some took me much longer to absorb. So regardless of which stage of your career you're at, I think you might benefit from these, even if you're just starting. And just as a disclaimer, I don't think these are necessary for everyone. Every person has their own path and every organization values different things differently. So don't think of these as requirements or rules. These are just some lessons that I've learned in the last couple of years that helped me get to where I am now. So without further ado, let's go through all of them in no specific order. So one of the obstacles that I subconsciously place in front of myself when programming is trying to make everything perfect. I want a perfectly designed feature, perfectly defined requirements, perfectly written code and tests, and a perfectly executed deployment. Sadly, some of these are not always possible. The longer I am in this career, the more I realize that everything is a trade-off. There is usually a choice to be made at every stage of the software development process, and every choice has different upsides and downsides. And as a developer, my job isn't actually to find the perfect solution that works in all cases, because that's often just impossible. My job is to find the right set of trade-offs that minimizes the risk and is the least flawed for my particular use case. This involves choices in all areas like determining the right amount of design work that needs to be done before you start implementing the feature, or choosing the library that will handle some of the lower level implementation details, or finding the right amount of people who should look at the code before it's deployed. And this is where we get to the next point. I already mentioned this, but whether you like it or not, in this line of work, we make decisions all the time. Some of them will be made more unconsciously maybe because of your experience or the lack of it, when you don't even know there are other options. And some of these decisions will be made because of a convention that was earlier picked by the team. I think it's important to notice these decisions, look for imperfections in the approach that you and your team are about to take, and consider whether the alternatives wouldn't do the job better in this specific case. If you're in doubt about the choice, ask your colleagues Someone might have that extra tiny bit of experience that you're missing, or a completely different idea whatsoever, and it might be better than anything you thought about, no matter how experienced you think you are. And it works both ways. In your mind, challenge every idea you hear about, and consider whether there's a better alternative. And don't be afraid to speak up if you find one. People come from all backgrounds with all sorts of different stories, and this kind of diversity has brought many brilliant ideas into my work, and I appreciate it greatly. Speaking of decisions and ideas, there are many factors that influence these decisions. Some of them might be maintainability or efficiency, or maybe you're a functional programmer and you want your code to be purely functional with only immutable data structures. Or maybe you're trying to keep a low cost of abstraction and consider duplicating some code. So what should be the primary factor that influences your decisions? I already know what's mine. And at this time, the single most important factor is production. If your software doesn't go to production, nothing else matters. You will not have users, you will not have transactions, and you will not have money. If your company loses profits because your team couldn't deliver a feature to production, nobody will bat an eyelash at how functional your code was, or how low the latency of an HTTP request was, or how many tests you've written. You need to focus on getting to production in reasonable time with correctly functioning software. That's the first and foremost concern 
that I try to keep in mind when making my decisions. Now, how you get to that place is a totally different story. Making the code easy to maintain is a close second on my list, but it's also only relevant if your product is going to survive. Otherwise, it doesn't matter because there's nothing to maintain. And how you achieve maintainability, that's up to you and your team. Your job as a programmer or software developer is not to just write code. The sooner you realize that, the better. The best code you can maintain is no code at all. And maintenance is an important factor in the cost of a project. So if you can solve the problem without writing new code, everyone will be happy. But how do you do this? Sometimes you can solve a problem before it even becomes one. For example, users might claim they want some functionality. When confronted with that claim, you can ask yourself the question, what does the user actually need? If your team has a close relationship with the users or the client, you might be able to collaborate and piece together a simpler solution for their need. Or invent a workaround that is good enough doesn't take much effort to implement and gets you to the goal quicker so that you can see the outcome sooner and react more rapidly, all of that without massive effort. So long story short, find the real problem before you try and solve it. Another important point related to making decisions and keeping a code base maintainable, you need to pick your battles. It took me long enough to realize that there were some tasks that would just never be done. Either because the priorities change and an entire bunch of tickets are not going to be implemented in the foreseeable future, or some parts of a feature that were deemed less of a priority and not must-haves ended up being abandoned simply because nobody needed that extra 1%, especially given the amount of effort to get it done. This also applies to tech debt and any kind of legacy code that you think should be improved, rewritten, or just refactored. I personally often get the urge to refactor something simply because I don't like the way it's written, it's old, or I think it's hard to understand, but sometimes it's just not worth it. If it does its job, doesn't bring problems in production, and isn't changed a lot, there's just no need to touch that code. If you do, you are only increasing the risk that something goes wrong. It's a totally different story if that code is at the core of your system, but these are often kept up to date because they change a lot and are mission critical. So I figured I needed to learn to live with this unfinished business, these pieces of code that I shouldn't touch until they become a problem. Basically, accept the fact that some things are never going to be done. And that's okay. As for the things that you still think should be done, make sure they are correctly prioritized so that you don't spend all your time refactoring legacy code and none of your time implementing business critical features. I would definitely advise looking for a healthy balance here. Being a senior developer doesn't mean you don't make mistakes. And many times the ones to find yours will actually be less experienced than you. Stay humble, keep your eyes and ears open and welcome any kind of feedback from your colleagues even if they are new to the job. And this goes both ways as well. Don't hesitate to bring up a potential issue in something that your senior colleague did. In the worst case, you'll find out you were wrong, but you will find out why. In the best case, your colleague will thank you and you will be the reason why something didn't blow up later. Speaking of labels, don't be too attached to your job description either. There are times when we need to step out of the artificial boundaries that have been defined to separate developers, team leaders, product managers, and so on, and do something that doesn't quite fit our modus operandi. Whenever you see a spot to be filled, some job to be done that nobody really feels responsible for, and yet it seems like something you could do this time, just take it on. Somebody needs to do it, so it might as well be you. Of course, if you're already busy with more important work, you can try to delegate that to someone else and just give them some of your guidance. This will be noticed, and as I progress in my career, I keep finding these opportunities to step into somebody else's shoes and show that I am not just another person only writing code. Some of this extra work might actually be something that you're supposed to do when you get promoted. Like in my case, 
Splitting a list of requirements into small tasks that are ready to be picked up by the entire team or organizing a meeting to discuss further steps in a milestone. If you feel like you're the only go-to person in some area, try to find someone else that you can mentor in it. Nobody should be irreplaceable. If you want to spend your holidays peacefully, make sure you're not the only person who understands that feature that you've just deployed. Let your colleagues know where they can go for more information if they need it. When you make an important decision, make sure it's correctly documented. When you make a hard one in code, add a comment, explain your reasoning. And this isn't just about the code we write at work. You can share a lot more than that. You can mentor less experienced colleagues, offer them help when you see they are struggling, lead internal workshops. The possibilities are endless. It's much easier to progress when you have someone to look up to, to learn from. And sharing your knowledge is a great way to progress as well. Now that we're talking about progress again, remember that this line of work requires continuous improvement. If you're not moving forward, you're moving backward. So make sure you stay up to date, develop new skills, and improve existing ones. Read a blog post about something that you have no idea about. If you're a backend developer, go to a frontend conference. If you write Scala, learn some Rust. If you haven't had a production incident recently, read some postmortems from other companies. Maybe they are dealing with problems that you've never dreamed about. Basically, try to see the world of programming from a different perspective every now and then. And last but not least, you're only human. Take your time, because this isn't a sprint. And it's okay to take a break, because we sometimes all need one. You have all your life to make any kind of growth you want. And the success of the company that you work for will not give you back your family time, your lost sleep, your health. In the extreme, if you are being forced to work over time or in other terrible conditions, make sure you have a way out and use it. Know your worth and don't let your work become your life. I've been there and it's just not worth it. I do believe we need to constantly push ourselves, but not to the limit. So find your limit and stay away from it. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next video.